USQ is home to the Centre for Australian Indigenous Knowledges. The Centre for Australian Indigenous Knowledges, or CAKE as we know it, is designed to support Indigenous students here on campus at USQ, as well as providing research opportunities for academics from within USQ and from all over Australia. We hope you enjoy the following presentations. And still there are many within our society today who say Australians are not racist and who hold the mantra of egalitarianism. All people are treated equal at birth and dutifully adhere to the well-worn saying of giving a man a fair go in work and play. I would like to think those idealists, idealists have repositioned their worldview on the sanitised utopia they would like to believe exists in Australia after the infamous East Coast event, a non-Indigenous one at that, which occurred on December 11, 2005, the Cronulla riot. Marcus Strom shed some light in an article published in the Labor Tribune of the Cronulla riot. On December 11, a chauvinist mob of 5,000 gathered at North Cronulla to deliver a startling message. No wogs and no lebs, Australian Lebanese, on our beaches. Leave our women alone. We grew here, you flew here, and so on. They gathered in, in response to an alleged assault on two surf lifesavers by a Lebanese gang. Strom said the gang randomly attacked anyone they thought had a Middle Eastern appearance, including an Aboriginal bloke. Alfred Deakin opened his 1901 election campaign by favouring a white Australia in which the absolute mastering and dominant element shall be British. It would appear 104 years later that successive governments have actively bolstered their emphatic credence to the detriment of all non-Anglo-Saxon Australians, of course, unless you were, you were of European appearance. Jupp asserts that the clarion of the national anthem, those who come across the sea with boundless plains to share, was no joke, although it was made into one when Australia was punishing several thousand Afghans and Iraqis for daring to take up the offer in 2001. Whilst the Australian population is kept in check by societal constraints imposed by democratic processes, the government will continually boast through the media that we peacefully coexist in a society that embraces multiculturalism. The government likes to give the impression that we are all Australians and that ethnicity is not a substantive issue of concern, economically or socially, unless of course individual or group challenges to societal norms are mut of mutual respect and decency are evident. Then that's a different matter and is the precursor for identification by the authority of their ethnicity. Jones and Hill Barnett argue that in many cases ethnic ideology is primarily the property of ethnic elite. A condition that makes it possible for a national government at times to ignore the existence of diversity at the local level, but at other times to use it as a mechanism to manipulate that elite structure. And so it is with Indigenous people, the most socially and economically disadvantaged group in Australia, with governments have forced their hegemonic influence through brutal conquests in 1788, imposed racist policy throughout the 19th and 20th century, and more recently, at the turn of the 21st century, imposed overtly discriminatory laws such as the Northern Territory Emergency Intervention Bill that are coming to the crux of my debate. A comparative analysis of national health data of Indigenous populations in Australia, New Zealand, Canada and the United States of America finds that Australia ranks bottom in the league table of first world nations working to improve the health and life expectancy of Indigenous people. The key health indicators make it plain. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders die nearly 20 years younger than non-Indigenous Australians. This is in stark contrast to the USA, Canada and New Zealand where the life expectancy for Indigenous people is approximately seven years less than the non-Indigenous population. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders infant mortality is three times the rate of non-Indigenous Australians and more than 50% higher than for Indigenous children in the US and New Zealand. These health indicators are not only a national scandal, they are an inter international scandal when compared to recent health advances in Indigenous populations in first world countries. The report overwhelming, Overcoming Indigenous Disadvantage, Key Indicators 2005, shows that Indigenous home ownership, an important economic indicator of wealth and saving for Indigenous people, is much lower at 27 than for non-Indigenous people at 74%. It is difficult to look at home ownership in isolation of other social indicators to gain a clearer picture of Indigenous disadvantage. 
In fact, home ownership is perhaps the final indicator that observers to this debate should assess when weighing up the proportion of Indigenous people who have succeeded against the odds. So why is over income distribution skewed for Indigenous people? Why is there a marked difference in age profile of the two discernible groups? So why is there a rising disparity in hospitalisations for potentially preventable conditions? So why is diabetes, year 12 retention and male imprisonment rates alarmingly high? Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, during a visit to London in April on the year of uh, 2001, announced I, I'll have to come back and can you you can edit that can't you? I just didn't have the date in there. First, okay, um, that would have been 2000 and 2008. No, 2000. Yeah, Prime Minister Kevin Rudd during a visit to London in April 2008 this announced an annual. I'll start that again. I've only got three more paragraphs. Prime Minister Kevin Rudd during a visit to London uh, in April uh, 2008 announced an annual progress statement on closing the life expectancy gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. He said this would build on the promise he made to improve Indigenous life expectancy, which is 17 years shorter than for non-Indigenous people. Mr Rudd said that in a modern and prosperous Australia, there should be no reason for these gaps to exist. Each year we must, as a government and as a people and a country, know what progress had been made in closing the gap, he said. We should not underestimate in our country the size of this challenge. Each year in the Australian Federal Parliament on the first working day we will mark that with a prime ministerial statement reporting progress on closing the gap in life expectancy, closing the gap in terms of infant mortality and closing the gap in literacy and numeracy outcomes, he said. Let's hope that our next generation will not have to ask Kevin Rudd to please explain when he's promised to close the gap is not realised as is predicted on current trends.